Um, this is the hottest panel of the day, I think. The hot topics. Uh, this is talking about festivals in the complex world we live in. Um, I mean, we're all in Jerusalem. What a complex place this is. And it's in, you know, Israel's in the headlines all over the world for different reasons. And yeah, there's a lot to talk about how film festivals can react to political situations, to censorship, just to different political parties coming in and out. And I think this is happening all over the world, um, from Trump's America to Brexit, et cetera. And there can be some real opportunities for festivals to help make a difference in this world, I think, in the kinds of films they can show and the bravery that festival programmers show. So let me introduce our panel. At the end is Karen Rivend Siegel, Riven Rivkind Siegel who is the artistic director of Doc of Eve International Film Festival, which is the documentary film festival in Tel Aviv. Great film festival, it happens in May, just after Cannes, mark your calendars. Um, we have Smitri Kiram, who's the creative director of the Geo Mami Mumbai Film Festival, which is in October. And we have Ahmet, are you gonna help me with your surname? Oh, just call him Ahmet. <laughs> Uh, who is a filmmaker, a critic. Um, he just told me he's worked for 41 different film festivals in 31 years. I don't think anybody in the room can top that. Um, he, oh, there's one person who has, okay. Um, <laughs> so um, he's one of the persons who steers the Festival on Wheels in Turkey. He's been the Turkish film scout for Berlin and Cannes. So big festivals, local festivals. Um, Ahmet has done them all. Um, I wanted to start um, with Kareen. And you know, you get, as does Jerusalem Film Festival, you get some money from the minister, Ministry of Culture here. Um, and um, presumably you need that money for the festival to survive? You know, yeah. yeah, and I mean, it's not, our full budget is not no. for the ministry. Uh, but yes, absolutely. Okay. Um, I'm gonna say it, you know, you've got a minister of culture <laughs> who is very, very, very controversial and safe to say not beloved by friends of free speech and the film community. Um, so how do you reconcile, do you ever have to interact with the minister herself? Personally, myself, no, uh, but I have to say that we were, we were never censored. Uh, yeah. Dokabib, I know other festival had uh, issued, but we were never censored, so. Okay. Uh, and in general, uh, as a policy, uh, we believe in a freedom of speech and artistic freedom, so uh, we were not, uh, you know, if something will happen, then we will have to uh, think about what we're doing, but um, we have uh, complete freedom in okay. terms of the festival, I say. Okay. And what about for Israeli filmmakers who, you know, you, you deal with those Israeli filmmakers a lot, are they well, concerned and upset? A or? lot of them are, again, they're funded uh, by yeah. the government as well. I mean, also not fully, but I think uh, it's uh, very important, no matter which government it is, to be supported, uh, to support uh, cultural mm -hmm. events. Um, so I, as long as they don't uh, censor themselves, and uh, you know, uh, then, then we can still show uh, amazing films that are uh, from a lot of uh, different uh, point of views, and this is what we've done so far, so I hope this really continues. Uh, okay, thank you. I know some of this is quite sensitive to talk about, so thank you all for talking about it in public, first of all, because I think it's important for other festivals. It's important to talk to them. Yes. It's important to talk, to talk about it. Yeah. Of course. Um, I mean, I know I personally felt really weird when I was here in 2014, and there was bombing going on, and you know, uh, the film festival here obviously gets money from the government and that just felt, you know, it just was, everybody was concerned. And I think they did give a platform that year to a lot of Israeli filmmakers wanted to come out and make a statement um, condemning some of the acts of the government and the festival gave them that platform, which I thought was really, really powerful. And there were tears and, um, you know, do you feel like you, can you sign a petition against the culture minister or, uh, you know, join in protests against it really that? Depends. Yeah, to where it gets, yeah. you know. Um, but as of so now, they're letting you have complete creative and artistic freedom at your festival. Right. So there's not that issue directly with your festival, so. Yes. Okay. 
Yes. Um, Smriti, let's pass on to you and tell us the situation in, in India and also um, specifically at Mami Mumbai Film Festival. Uh, so, um, you know, uh, the films that actually release in India are all censored. Um, there is a whole censorship body that kind of looks at content and uh, I think uh, as a nation we are very scared of sex. <laughs> violence is all fine. Oh, but violence I is think, fine, just no sex. Yeah, yeah, I think sex and um, religion and politics is something that kind of depends on which regime is in power mm. and uh, how much curtailing they would do of voices. Um, but at the festival, uh, the amazing thing is that uh, we have a provision called censor exemption. So all the films that actually play at Mami um, um, have an exemption, so they're not censored at all. And therefore, um, I hope everyone in the room at some stage gets to come to Mumbai because we've uh, got a film, Crazy Nation. It's almost like a religion in India to watch movies. Um, we're also a nation in one part of our country. Um, film stars actually have temples and people worship them. Uh, so so uh, film is a very, very strong source of entertainment, but it's also a fantastic influencer, hence, because everybody watches. Uh, and film festivals actually in my country have a lot of relevance because you actually, th those are the only places where you can watch movies the way the filmmaker intended you to watch it. So therefore... So that's you know, an important role. It, it yeah. has a very important role because I think um, in every ecosystem, film festivals uh, kind of uh, play different, uh, you know, sort of the relevance changes mm. uh, depending on the country, depending on the ecosystem that the festival exists in. Uh, in my country, the reason uh, film festivals are really important spaces is because you can actually show content uh, without anyone, um, you know, meddling with it. And you don't get government funding, for actually, no, for the festival. We are, we are actually the only privately funded festival in India. Okay. But um, um, we would like government funding. They're just not funding us. <laughs> <laughs> She's willing to sell out. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, no. Uh, but is the any government pressure ever about any or any government involvement do they have a hand in anything not doing nothing as yet um, you know they've not kind of interfered with our programming or who we invite to the festival um, and and the kind of films that we actually show uh, that's not happened as yet mm -hmm. um, but basically the thing is that in any country I think government is a great enabler if they choose to be and one of the things that I feel apart from censorship that has gotten hobbled in our country is that um, Europe is actually funding all of our independent cinema, uh, and we are doing no funding at all. Yeah. So, uh, frankly, if you, um, uh, I mean, filmmakers in India have no avenue of getting any funding, uh, except for NFDC, I think, okay. uh, is the only body that kind of funds independent cinema. And there's been some rocky yeah. times oh. at the NFDC. That's a whole other panel, yeah. probably. Yeah. Yes, yeah. exactly. So I, I think that when you don't have government kind of, um, you know, instituting, um, you know, bodies that actually um, actively try and influence culture and voices and filmmakers, uh, it really hobbles, um, it, inaction also hobbles yes. culture as much as action does. And I think, uh, you know, more and more as we kind of go forward and meet a lot of people uh, who have funding from government and their institutions, which are autonomous, um, uh, who are doing this, we really feel that in our country, you know, that is one of the key problems as far as film filmmaking is concerned. Right. Okay. And it's probably worth noting, you know, going back to Kareen, what you were saying, you know, we might not like the Israeli Minister of Culture, but the ministry is helping filmmakers make films. You know, they are funding filmmakers' works, and that's important. So we can't just tar it all with the same brush, probably. Um, Ahmet, maybe you can give us a, a little overview of, I can hand you this one, uh, of what's happening in Turkey right now in terms of any censorship or any, I know, you know, at the Istanbul Film Festival in 2015, I think there was some censorship issues that came to light, but maybe you can talk about what you know. Uh, well, regarding the festivals, uh, we have a very strange law. As a festival programmer, I can bring any foreign film to my festival and present it without any certificate. But as for Turkish films, 
they have to apply to the Ministry of Culture and ask for a certificate. 7 plus, 13 plus, 15 plus, 18 plus, something like that. As far as I know, the only film which was censored was a Norwegian production some 12 years ago, but it was all over the world X-rated. What happened uh, in Istanbul three, four years ago, there was a documentary, a Turkish-Kurdish documentary, let's say, and it had two directors. One was in the hospital with a heart attack, the other is a journalist. So I think the festival made a mistake, took the film without asking for the certificate, and before the film was going to be screened, the director refused to send the film to the Ministry of Culture. Well, it was a political decision, was quite clever on the other hand. And then the film was, the yeah, the film was banned. And then suddenly, domino effect, a jury member said, he is out. Then other jury members left. Then the international jury left. The festival literally collapsed. Freddie was there, he would know. So what happened? It was uh, not very good for the reputation of the Istanbul Film Festival. So uh, it is always very tricky. I mean, I was talking to Screen, I think, for four or five years ago, and they asked me about this question, and I said, our ministry people are clever enough not to censor anything, because it becomes public, it becomes a wonderful advertisement for the producer, for the director, and at that time, I was running the Turkistan in Cannes. At least five festival programmers came to me and asked for a screener of this film, which I didn't have. On the other hand, there was a private screening uh, for some important critics and festival programmers. Nobody liked the film. So, <laughs> you see, I mean, this is really very tricky. Censorship festivals, how it is going. Thank you. And so, I know it's speculation on your part, but if if the filmmakers had applied for the certificate and shown, then the government probably would have let it show at the festival, you think? Or I'm based in Ankara. I know uh, the general director of cinema. I, uh, well, I broke my ankle and I was in Ankara. I couldn't go to the festival and everyone was calling me. Now there is something going on in Istanbul, so you are afraid to come. I said, no. I. <laughs> I can't, I just can't, yeah. And the thing is, I was told the minister was ready to give a certificate, but the director rejected to send the film. He was, I, I mean, he was doing it for his own propaganda, and he succeeded, actually. Yeah, he succeeded. Interesting. Um, you know, in times where there might be some upheaval or, you know, particular right-wing governments that aren't necessarily backing freedom of speech, never thought I'd say this. In America, even, we have that now. Um, but uh, is there a role for film festivals to play to make sure your programs then are really being adventurous? Can you then take more risks? Uh, you know, is there an audience appetite to really see more films about politics or see more films they're not seeing in the mainstream media? Do festivals have a role in these challenging times like that? Definitely, and uh, we um, we can see it. it's always a fear that people will not have, you know, oh, this is depressing, or this is uh, too complicated, we've seen it already, you know, um, we can see it in the audiences that come to see films that do have uh, an impact and do have a different vision of what they see in the media, uh, definitely. Um, so, um, and, and you feel, uh, you know, in the zeitgeist that it's happening, um, uh, even, you know, with like Me Too, things like that, it it's before that, that that things already films are being made, and when we screen films that are relevant, uh, they they really succeed. Um, so there is an appetite, and uh, we're lucky. Um, I think as festival, uh, first of all, to see many many films on one subject, and then really in our point of view to choose the right one, because we can we have to know that the audience they do not watch as many. Uh, you know, we can have three, four hundred films about uh, immigrants, they don't see those. Uh, so we try to find the best ones and, and there is an audience. 
I mean, say something like the refugee crisis. You know, we're starting to see more films about that. You know, are you in, are, are filmmakers, you know, making really thoughtful films about that? Are they sort of churning them out quickly? Are you seeing the types of work you would like to see about some subjects like that? Yes. Yeah. Uh, and I think, uh, well, the, the refugee um, issues has been going on for, for too many years now. So, uh, but you can see films yet that have been made uh, for uh, the last two years, for example, and they're very, very artistic and very, very personal, but also very, uh, very uh, open and very revealing. Uh, so there's this point of view that is uh, is really different, and, and people relate. And then it's easier even to to relate to those uh, subjects, and you see it again, or or in a yeah. And also, I, uh, the fact that we can wa uh, we can screen films that are uh, of uh, of a certain length, so longer you can. You can meditate on them, you can learn from them in a different way, but you can just get the news in them. And what would you say about Israeli documentary scene? Are you know are filmmakers taking risks? Are they being quite political in the topics they're covering? Are you seeing any trends in sort of I modern uh, Israeli I documentary? I think it's, it's a little too early to say if there's a shift, mm -hmm. uh, because Israeli films are known to be uh, political films, but also very personal films about their families. And so, you know, we see, you see films uh, about uh, the political uh, issues and uh, agendas, uh, but it's uh, it's still versatile. So, uh, but you can see also, you know, you, you see uh, more, you know, um, settlers who will make films, but also um, uh, Israeli filmmakers that <coughs> will try to get to the other side and, and try to understand what they're doing. So there's like a investigative uh, understanding kind of thing not necessarily agreeing, but trying to, to get her thing. Yes. yes. Thank you. And Smriti, um, with films you're choosing for Mommy, does that change depending on the sort of climate of the year, do you think? Or, you know, we're all talking about women in film. Do you then show more films by women? Or how do you um, stay in touch with that zeitgeist, I guess? I, I think, um, you know, uh, as a festival, you need to decide uh, what your personality would be. And, um, uh, you know, I think the quality of the narrative cannot, uh, no matter what you want to highlight, cannot be ignored. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, you, you can even look at themes. I think curation is very, very important as far as the festival is concerned because um, you do want people to discover more material than they already sort of are geared up to watch. Uh, and, and so what we do is, I mean, of course, it cannot be a tone-deaf festival. You cannot just have a festival which is programming without looking at what's happening around the world. And, um, you know, um, but for us, I, I, I think um, uh, everything, every um, sort of defiance, whether it's in mainstream cinema or independent cinema, becomes important because we are also a country that hasn't repealed a, a you know, a, a 377, which sort of uh, makes uh, LGBT um, you know, existence um, illegal in my country. Mm -hmm. Hopefully that's gonna happen in another 10 days, um, that we are gonna not be a backward nation and kind of sexually grow up and allow people to be um, you know, uh, free and, and, and make their choices. Um, so for us, uh, political awareness in our programming is cardinal. Uh, though we do have to be careful a little bit as to what are the defiances that we are choosing to mm. kind of, uh, you know, put out there. Because, um, you know, it's you also don't want to take on something that is going to completely shut you down, right? But then the thing is we, we, we do, um, we've started, uh, you know, programming a lot more in terms of uh, women filmmakers. Mm. But like I said that, you know, we don't want to kind of um, lose, um, what is primary, which is that the narrative as well as the film and what is the product that we are putting out there has to be interesting, has to be a quality cinema. Mm. And within that, uh, we do themize and we do kind of look for narratives that we feel have to be put out there. Mm. You know, and uh, in, our, in India, what is also important is that we are constantly doing audience development because uh, a lot of the um, a lot of the content doesn't reach uh, people because, like I said, there is censorship. 
So what tends to happen is that the 16,000 people who are watching it at the festival get to watch it. But eventually when it filters down to the rest of the country, um, it filters down, only that content gets filtered down which is censored. So sometimes everything is lost because you've made those five cuts in a film. Yeah. And you mentioned in there that you wouldn't want to take on a film that would sort of overshadow the rest of the program or get you get things sort of shut down. Um, maybe you don't want to talk about specific films, but what, what kind of film do you mean that would just be such a problem that it would ruin the festival or...? or you know, the thing is that, um, I mean, um, the, I mean, we did we did kind of uh, do that with a film called Sexy Durga, which oh, yeah. uh, which actually won, um, you know, the Haywash Tiger at Rotterdam. And uh, Durga is a goddess. Um, Durga is the name of a goddess uh, that we worship in India. And uh, but Durga can be the name of uh, any woman as well. And um, the title of the film actually um, caused a lot of um, um, a lot of you know, sort of unrest in the country because it was called Sexy Durga. So, um, so God is not supposed to be, goddess is not supposed to be sexy or a sexual I mean, being. Normal women are not supposed to be sexy, so I guess gods would be, you know, just um, really pushing it. But, uh, but we did program that uh, at our festival and it showed in competition and there's a jury that watched it and it got an award. So, you know, it, basically the thing is we've not right now uh, come across that kind of material that we would not program. But what I meant was that, you know, you also want to exist mm -hmm. because you know that if you didn't, it would do more harm right. than... There would be so many films, hundreds of films and filmmakers that wouldn't yeah. have the benefit. Um, and just like I asked Karine, um, you know, with the Indian films you're seeing, especially the sort of non-Bollywood independent Indian cinema, do you feel like Indian filmmakers are, are taking risks or are pushing things forward? Absolutely. Uh, they are doing that. They are also, um, you know, even in our mainstream, I think uh, people have started to, filmmakers have started to introduce elements which uh, did not exist earlier. And uh, so it's a very, very interesting time uh, to be in film in India. It's also, um, I, I think, um, in an environment which kind of tries to uh, shut your voice down, I think that is the time that we've seen in history that you know art really flourishes because people feel the need to kind of speak out and um, you know kind of like let their voice be heard. And I think India is also going through that kind of a you know that kind of a change, that kind of a movement um, is underway and filmmakers are becoming bolder with the subjects that they choose and their voices are becoming stronger. So it's very interesting to see the kind of films that we are getting and are, uh, you know, getting, um, that are being permitted to the festival. Mm. So it's becoming bolder and bolder. In fact, uh, nobody seems to be censoring themselves at yeah. all. Interesting, I'd like to hear that. And Ahmed, in Turkey, maybe you can talk a little bit about the Turkish filmmaking scene, are people pushing political ideas with films and, and you know, any I guess, bold choices you've made with programming? Well, Turkey is a little bit different. I mean, uh, our system doesn't look like uh, the European one uh, and doesn't look like uh, the US. We have some big companies producing blockbusters, mostly comedies, and our domestic share in the box office is since 13 years, over 50%. So like India, US, uh, South Korea, Japan, and China, I think we are one of the five, six countries with a huge domestic box office share. Uh, these are comedies, I, it's okay for me. Instead yeah. of watching um, stupid American comedies, let them watch stupid Turkish comedies, yeah. I don't care. Because <laughs> the industry goes on. But on the other hand, there are art house films which only make 10, 20, 30,000 admissions in the box office, which are traveling to festivals. So our festival is Festival on Wheels. It's a traveling festival. So we begin in Ankara in the capital, then go to small cities, to universities, and there are even cities that are no cinemas. So we bring our films with us. So definitely we never choose any film 
which has the slightest chance to be broadcast on TV. So we are looking for art house Turkish films, for sure some political films, some films which have a message to give, uh, and uh, also some shorts and documentaries. So we are looking for an audience which is there, and uh, there are two different kinds of people. The ones who watch on the TV, and the ones who are looking for something which could be interesting. So most probably all the festival goers are like that. I mean, we are programming films for people who do not watch any uh, mainstream films on TV, but looking for some edgy, political, different films. So that's, our, that's the programming. And most of the festivals do the same, I think. For sure, there are some festivals which are open to public, but also to young people, students, so they have to decide in their programming. They have to also put some mainstream films or some films quite famous in their program, but uh, there must be a good balance. But we are mostly for art house, edgy, political films. And are these showing to an older audience, to a younger audience? Are younger people interested in these films? Uh, well, almost 70% are students and a lot of medical doctors are coming watching. I don't know why, all, all, all people, uh, retired people, uh, but mostly they are uh, old academicians or young students. I mean, for sure there are also some programs for kids, but uh, we were just trying to uh, investigate this, how it is going on, uh, but it's almost 70% uh, students. And I don't know how it is here, but the students who are studying film are not very interested. Maybe, maybe they are to totally bored. Yeah, uh, they are studying sociology and law and other stuff. Sriji, do you get young audiences coming out? Old audiences? Are they all engaged? Yeah, we we do. We have a, a really. We I mean at least um, you know fifty percent of our audience is really young. Uh, and the other age group um, that actually comes in is 24 to 35. Uh, and then we get a lot of older people who come and watch movies. So really interested, um, you know, students who are kind of like, uh, you know, signing up for money. And we also have a year-round program. Uh, and um, that actually has been the real, um, you know, sort of victory as far as we are concerned. Because, um, um, Independent films don't find a release in India very easily. Things have become better now, but um, you know it's not as if um, the, there's a cinema chain or there is a home for independent uh, cinema in India. Um, so um, what people are watching is actually really popular cinema um, from world over as well as uh, you know Bollywood. Uh, that is what they get to watch uh, normally. So uh, when we um, came in in 2015. Um, I think one of the things that we wanted to do was that we wanted to start a year-round program because you can't dump 200 independent films on a nation that only watches popular cinema year-round. And just in a week, you're like, why don't you Change watch Lobster? Yeah. <laughs> and, and not the next Amir Khan film. Yeah. So uh, we started the year-round program with the intention of kind of providing um, you know, content to people uh, regularly. Uh, from all across the world. It also uh, helped us program a lot of lot more than what we can at the festival because there's a there's a there's a certain limit of films that you can actually include in your program. But uh, we could then forge relationships with a lot of countries and uh, kind of discover films from different countries that otherwise would be just simmering under the surface. You know, because there is only that much that even festivals around the world program from a certain country. Yeah. So there's a lot of content that just gets unwatched. I mean, it's kind of like, you know, not there. Mm. So uh, it's allowed us to bring a lot more to, um, you know, cinema goers in India mm. uh, through that program. And Karine, you're also showing films that most people don't have the chance to see any other week of the year, usually. Yeah, exactly. I, how are you connecting with audiences on this? Are the, is that a young audience, an older audience, a bit of both? It's a, it's a mix. I okay. think when the festival started uh, 20 years ago, it was mostly, you know, 50, 60 uh, one, the people that 
came, you know, they had time and they watched, but now we have uh, 60,000 people coming to the festival, so it's really become uh, a huge uh, um, event in Tel Aviv. Uh, so we try also to engage uh, younger audiences. I mean, every year uh, since I'm there, I feel that there's more and more young people mm -hmm. that are coming. But we do a lot of outdoor screenings uh, around Tel Aviv uh, to reach a lot of people. Uh, in Tel Aviv. Uh, a lot of people, and, and we get that. I mean, it works. And, and what's nice also that after the festival, we get, because there's, um, there's not a lot of distribution in, in Israel at all. I mean, there's very, there are very little uh, uh, cinemas in Tel Aviv, uh, unfortunately. Um, but, and, but there are uh, documentary channels. So there are, some of the films do screen up, to, um, do broadcast afterwards uh, on television, some of them but a lot are not, and then we have the chance to act as um, you know, mini distributors and to show films uh, around Israel. Uh, and we have two, main, two more festivals uh, in Israel, one in the, the north and in the Galilee, uh, and one in the south. So we do, one of our missions is to reach to as many people to see documentaries. Um, and so in, the, um, in both uh, the south and the north, uh, we, we have a, a morning program for uh, school uh, school children and, and you know, uh, 12th grade, uh, from, first, from fifth grade to 12th grade, and we try to to bring uh, bring them the best you know films that they can, controversial films also, so they can discuss it. Um, so even the kids can see some of these. Exactly, and we try. I mean, this is very difficult. We did it um, once or twice with very very small kids, and it really worked. So we are feeling that uh, in the end we're building a future audience. I mean, we're working really hard on it. Um, it's mostly complicated in, in uh, Malot, which is a Malot of Shika. It's a, uh, a town that is divided by a, a highway of uh, um, a, a Jewish town and uh, an Arabic town. Okay. Somewhere and you show to both audiences. So they usually yeah. they're not uh, integrated. I mean, they go to different schools. They have different mm -hmm. cultures. They're not. They're, they have a lake where they go and see each other, but it's not integrated. Uh, it's very very uh, segregated mm -hmm. in that way. Uh, and so we bring them together. I mean, and it's very very easy when they're in a, a you know fourth and fifth grade. It, they're, they're cooperating. It's more difficult when it's obvious when they're older. Mm -hmm. uh, for all kind of reasons, um, uh, but but we do it every year for the last ten years. So this is something we do also um, a workshop with them like to make films with a filmmaker. So and is your festival? Do you show films from the Arab world? Do you show Palestinian films today? Well, I wish uh, yeah. I wish we could. Um, Israeli Arabs, of course. Uh, we it is interesting because it's a I mean, some will not let us, um, uh, but when we do, it's really amazing. I mean, this year we showed uh, uh, an Iranian film uh, by Iranian filmmaker, um, uh, Maria Mibalimi, and, and she is in exile in Sweden, but the film was in Iran, and she came to the festival, and she had such a beautiful welcoming, and it was overwhelming. And and we had a Kurdish filmmaker who came with his Syrian wife and kids. I mean, it, it, it's, it was, we, were, we were afraid of that, I mean, in terms of if they would get in and everything, and yeah. it, was, it was perfect, I mean, it's okay. Yeah. So it's really encouraging. Uh, I wish for more. Yes, that's yeah. good to hear. Yeah. Yeah. Um, are there any questions out there yet? We've got a question from Jill. Let me just um, summarize. So this is Jill Samuels from Films Without Borders. She has a lot of work um, with kids in poverty um, around the world and tried to get a visa to go shoot in Delhi and the government didn't really like the idea of them shooting poverty. 
Did get it eventually. Just shooting kids. That is really unfortunate the because, yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, I, I can't comment on this because at least the half ticket section, which is the section under which we uh, program children's films uh, at uh, Mami, we got um, no, um, you know, rule like that that you actually cannot show kids or at least Indian kids in poverty because, uh, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, 70% of India, and that's a conservative estimate lives in abject poverty, the farmers killing themselves for 300 rupees, which is, um, you know, less than three dollars. So uh, there's no getting away from poverty. So really, really sorry that you had to go through this experience. Maybe we are airbrushing our poverty. <laughs> This is a question about the Israeli culture minister, Mary Regev. Yeah. Mary yeah. Regev. Yeah. If she gets it through, you've got such a powerful argument to about, you know, you've got the phrase of the shot fire, and you've got such a powerful argument to do would you then consider getting some kind of treat? I mean, this is put to go back 30 years, in which you can't be coming through. In fact, every program. Yeah, to affect us. Yeah, yeah to say if this sort of um, would you be, would you censoring law would comes you through. Do? Absolutely, but we'll have we'll have to see what happens, and then we'll have to react upon it. I mean, it's, I mean, personally, you know, me, I will have to think really where where my uh, stand is uh, within this industry because obviously I I care so much yeah. about about this uh, you know where we are today, which is in uh, Israel, and I've gotten so advanced and getting in great places. So. Um, other questions out there? Yes, Freddy? Yeah, I, I think uh, if people don't know about it, take the, the worst case that happened in the, uh, the latest years. It was, I mean, a couple of years, a few years ago in, in South Korea, uh, the festival, the Busan festival, they um, screened a film called Civil about this accident where 300. This very uh, disaster. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, 300 young people died, drowned, and then this this uh, film was critical against how the authorities handled this, and uh, this started. I mean, the, the authorities, the mayor of, of the sun and the, the the authorities in Seoul, they wanted to stop the screening, and the festival said, "No, we are independent. We screen it," and this started big thing and first they took away a lot of the funding for the festival and then in the end uh, uh, two of, of uh, the leading people in, in the festival had to go they are, they had to, they are back now but it, it was, it's been three years that it's been a turmoil and uh, of course they have also changed regime in, in, in Seoul so things have changed but, but I mean there was I mean the, 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 the right wing in, 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 in South Korea really tried to, to destroy the, I mean, the, the, the most important mm -hmm. festival in, in Asia. Yeah. Yeah, just for the mic purposes, uh, Freddie's just recounting in Busan in South Korea, there, three or four years ago, I guess, they showed this documentary about the Sewol ferry disaster, and it was critical of the government and authorities, and it you know almost brought the festival to its knees. They cut government funding for the festival, they pushed some of the leaders of the festival out, some of them have since returned. Um, but yeah, I think it was a real turning point for a lot of festivals, and a lot of festivals around the world came out in solidarity with them, but does that change the government reaction? No, it doesn't, you know. 
Uh, Freddy, my dear, not everyone has the privilege to live in Sweden. Yeah, but I, I would just have taken this up that really, in the democratic world, a festival was nearly stopped by, by, by the government. Scary. Yeah. Um, I mean, have any of you ever known instances of self censorship, either in organizations you've worked for or with filmmakers, sort of self censoring? Uh, to get approval or get funding, or anybody? Well, we have this uh, funding of the Ministry of Culture. It's not a huge money, but there is some money. And unfortunately, last, uh, this year, 450 feature-length projects applied, and there was money only for 39, so it's less than 10%. But I know that some people, when they write their scripts, synopsis, or let's say the project, they try to be superficial. Uh, if possible, if I write this, maybe it will be difficult to receive this money. So actually, it exists. I mean, uh, when I read a synopsis, I, I can say most probably it will be difficult to receive some money because there are some 14 people in the commission. And two or three will definitely say, what is this? So mostly in all countries, they have it, and uh, officially it doesn't exist, but unofficially in the minds of the uh, filmmakers, the script writers, directors, this unfortunately does exist. Okay. Have you seen any instances of this? Or? No, and the good thing is that's why I said that half of Europe is funding Indian independence cinema, so maybe we haven't seen that at all. That hasn't happened. I, I think, I mean, <coughs> this is completely off topic. I think, um, uh, you know, a lot of our filmmakers um, try and feed into um, the, the, the sort of, you know, Western perception of what India is. And, and now, with enough of the cinema being made, uh, even people outside have started to uh, see when somebody is making an inauthentic film just to, um, you know, play to the gallery. Uh, but that happens but because nobody is funding independent cinema in India. Uh, they've uh, no filmmakers feel any kind of pressure to kind of um, you know be complementary to the government or self censor themselves. Uh, maybe in the future, if uh, funding started coming from India, people might want to do that. Can I ask you? I mean, in, 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 in India, when the nationalist, the Hindu nationalist, is, is I mean, it, it's promoted. I mean, that's mainstream. Uh, Indian cinema uh, promote this nationalism as well? Yeah, I mean, mostly, I mean, that kind of narrative comes out uh, from uh, Bollywood, which is the mainstream cinema that exists in India. Uh, independent cinema doesn't often find a release in India, so it doesn't kind of influence anything. So if you see streams of uh, propaganda, you would probably see that in mainstream cinema. But it, do you see more of it? No, no. I, I think there used to be, at one point of time, there was a spate of films that would that would do that, but right now that is not happening. Why not? I mean, if I were a mainstream producer in India, in the, in, if there were a war between India and Pakistan, I would make a film on that. It's money. I mean, it, it depends on how you think, but uh, for mainstream filmmakers, they would sure, it happens in Turkey, they would sure make films about uh, some political issues or nationalistic issues which will bring money. I think interestingly in the last uh, year in India, there have been three major blockbusters that have come out that have spoken nothing, um, up, that have not fed into uh, the animosity that exists between India and Pakistan. I, I think that was the obsession at one point of time. But um, there was Bajrangi Bhaijan and there was Razi and um, um, Tigers in the Head. These are the three titles. And they were huge films with mega stars uh, that spoke of um, only, um, you know, um, sort of solidarity between the two countries. And uh, for the first time, kind of portrayed uh, people from Pakistan as normal human beings who are just like us. and. Uh, so th there's, there's, it, it's not happening anymore, strangely. Uh, and it's a welcome change. 
And have you seen Israeli filmmakers self-censor or any organizations have to sort of self-censor? Again, not yet. Uh, mm -hmm. We we'll watch the space, yeah. Yeah, and hope, hopefully with this law, uh, that, you know, <laughs> uh, what's <coughs> really important, I think, is that, uh, you know, there, there could be a dialogue, I mean, uh, but as long as, as I think, the, the people that uh, create the criteria and uh, they're uh, professional in the film world, you know, it's very important. And so this is really uh, a struggle, for yeah. hopefully. Uh, but, uh, but also, uh, also in, in, uh, I mean, in this democratic world, what we see now is that uh, 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 these countries with uh, uh, public support uh, they do a little font for more heroic or nationalist films or 100 years of Estonian film or uh, <laughs> label, I mean, yeah. uh, to promote uh, the nation and, 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 uh, and uh, the heritage. And, I mean, taking away, I mean, money from the independent filmmaker, uh, forcing them to, to, to make a script more based on the heroic heritage. Yeah, no, that does happen. I mean, in Finland, they had the 100 year yeah. anniversary, and there was a certain strand of films that got money because it was about pride and Finnish history. And some of those were good films, but yeah, it takes away from somebody wanting to make some radical experimental film about some contemporary topic if more of the funding, funding is funneled into these nationalist or pro-nationalist films? Well, it depends uh, if you are proud of your history. <laughs> I mean, uh, we also programmed a Finnish Film Week some 18 years ago, and we presented six films from Finland, and some of them were about the uh, uh, independence war, and they were also critical films, uh, but also nationalistic films. But the Germans, they are not very proud of their history, so they don't do that. Yet, now they have a far-right party, the alternatives, and when I watch German channels, I see them talking in the parliament. It can happen that there will be some nationalistic German films in the future, but at the time being, it's not possible. Fatih Akin made this film, Ask Them Nicht which is about the uh, Nazi murders in, uh, uh, 10 years ago in Germany, and they nominated it for an Oscar. It was the German nomination. It depends, it depends on your climate, political climate of your country. Does our friend from Estonia, do you want to say anything? No. <laughs> well, with Estonia, it's a little bit maybe even uh, more different because uh, we have so little money, usually, that the Estonian country was paid money even for that, and no historical war film was made. Uh, that was a historical film, but only about uh, putting on screen uh, kind of the, the, the main uh, novel we have, like uh, about the, the 30s, and that's more like a drama. But it's true that for the um, propaganda, uh, I don't know whether it takes away um, money from the experimental film be because it would have never been given to experimental film. <laughs> it's that it, it, it but it takes money maybe from a romantic comedy that doesn't have that historical significance. Uh, uh, I said Estonia because you have <laughs> yeah, we, we have worse. Ex I mean, we have we have Poland. We have uh, I mean, uh, uh, and we, we have Ukraine now that has a special fund for heroic films. Yeah. And yeah, but that money would have never been there for other films and in the UK it's or extra, it's, it's extra money okay. always. And I think it's uh, it's somehow should not get are the mainstream films better than the historic films? I really don't know. We are entering a very complex ground of water quality yeah. film. But it sounds like we should start a his, uh, historical epic heroic film festival, <laughs> and it's going to have lots of content when all these funded films come in. And we're going to talk about it a little bit at the next panel, but we did bring up the Me Too movement a little bit, and Smriti talked a little bit about that and how you react to that, and you're not going to just program a film you know, because of that. It needs to be a good film. Um, Alberto Barbera came out 
this week, I heard people read that on the screen saying, oh, you know, it's not our fault, there's only one woman in competition, we can only react to what's out there. Um, you know, this is a sort of, it's either a political movement, a human rights movement, depending on how you see it, but gender equality in film, you know, how do you each think about that when you're programming, or do you, do you need to think about that more? I think in, in our case, uh, I mean, we are definitely not a women's film festival. Uh, we agree that, you know, we, we, you know, we examine films and watch them uh, and select them for their quality of, of film and other things, but not necessarily of the gender. But what's nice is that our, nice or not, but that the, the situation is that we are mostly women uh, in the office. Uh, our, our team. Your programmers are mostly? The programmers are, are you know, split. it's really a, a split and it's a good, a very, very good mix. Uh, maybe the majority are women, but, but it's not, they're not selected because they're women. So, okay. so what I wanted to say is that uh, this year our program had 50% uh, uh, women filmmakers and or uh, co-directors, uh, co okay. but it was not within, maybe because there are a lot of women that it happened to be like that uh, as for other you didn't have a quota a target no, it just we happened, didn't. It happened, it happened which is also good last year and this is yeah. very this is hap uh, this is makes me happy i mean yeah. it's uh, it, it's not something that we were like uh, that we fought for we, it just happened so it's a good sign as opposed to you know other things that we that we want to show and include in the program that uh, that we're more sensitive about like mm -hmm. showing films uh, from Africa, it's, you know, so we're not, it's not in our, we don't see a lot, so we do search for them, and yeah. it's really important for us to have them. To seek them out. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And Sriti, you talked a bit about before, but, you know, um, you know uh, our team is all women. <laughs> so I always think of these strong really women running mommy, so yes, you're... So, um, the thing is that um, uh, not having enough representation is not just because of the fact that I, I think... Uh, there needs to be a deeper analysis as to why you don't have so many women directors out there, or you don't have, uh, you know, the workforce kind of working in key areas in film, um, um, you know, either producers or directors. I think um, I think we've also we do seek out, uh, you know, narratives which are led by women, but. Um, but what we've done, uh, and these are very small steps, you know, this might not even be significant, is, um, you know, we've, uh, we have a collaboration with Oxfam, and I think um, one of the things that we've started looking at is, um, you know, how a woman is presented in a narrative, what kind of, you know, what, what, what role do women play in films, and what kind of, uh, whether the film is, you know, gender sensitized or not to just examine that, to look at that, to at least start the conversation. There's a there's a cash prize also. That doesn't mean that filmmakers are going to run and kind of, you know, start writing better roles for women. But at least you'll start to see the different layers at which it exists because otherwise the conversation would not even happen. Um, and also for our ecosystem, uh, we've just initiated a report that we are launching uh, in the third week of August. Uh, with uh, We've been working on that for the last three years. Um, and uh, it's uh, Price Water Cooper and us who put a report together. It's just a start, uh, and we've not even been able to um, cover the different languages that exist in India. So we've just done this for Hindi cinema to begin with, and uh, it's to quantify uh, the statement that we often make, which is uh, that uh, there aren't enough women or there's not enough representation. But we don't know, um, you know, how deep the problem is because we have no report in India to refer to to actually get numbers where we can even try and, you know, sort of move towards a solution. So this is a first level paper uh, that has been done on the industry to kind of examine and put numbers and put some kind of quantifiability to, um, you know, the gender inequality that actually exists. So we are, we are kind of doing different things to kind of bring that to the fore. Great. I look forward to that report. I'll send it. Okay. <laughs> and Ahmed, what do you think about? Well, to this year, during the Cannes Film Festival, there was a panel organized by the Swedish Film Institute, Gender Equality, and I was there. Huge hall, some 500 ladies, and only 56 men. I counted them. 
including the cameraman. And it was very interesting. And the lady in charge of the Swedish Film Institute, I can't remember the name. Anna, yeah, Anna. Uh, she's very tough. And she came to the mic and said, look, I wanted to study film. Then I realized it would be very difficult com to compete with this man. So I studied law, and I returned. She did. But she said something different. Uh, the last funding, they just funded the films. And you know, Scandinavian uh, ladies are very tough. Freddie would know, 1974, they went to the political parties and they said, if you go on like that, we are going to have our own women's party. Now they have this 50%. And uh, in the parliament, they are, there's always this 50%. But uh, she said, after it came out, there were only 23% of the projects produced by uh, or directed by women. So this is a discussion. Uh, I must say it's a bit artificial. Then I can also say we need more nurses, male nurses. We don't have them. Why? I don't know. Because somehow nurses are more ladies since for for us Nightingale. So we need more women filmmakers. If we have only two out of ten, so the selection will be like that. But in Turkey, we have three women's film festivals. They don't let any male fly in. They never show any male director's films about women. So it's all about women. This can be a solution, but uh, equality is a bit difficult. I mean, there is nothing to do. So yeah, Jill's just saying she hopes this next generation is going to be able to change some things. We've got a couple of comments. Yeah, just so. a question. I'm, I'm really interested in what you said. Can you explain why is it artificial to have this discussion? Well, we don't have enough uh, female filmmakers. I mean, if I organize a festival and receive 1,000 applications and only 20 are women filmmakers and 980 uh, men. So it's very difficult, but that's why I say to do this, we have three women film festivals run by women, about women issues, films about women, and it's maybe it's more important. Maybe we should discuss this. I mean, there should be more films made for women. Uh, and on the other hand, there is another problem. There are, I don't know how it is here in Israel, but in Turkey, there are unfortunately not very good roles written for women. Most of the protagonists are men. This is also, this is the most important problem, I think. Yeah, I think, uh, I think for just those reasons that good roles are not written for women, because of course men are writing them. And number two, 
uh, that you don't have enough filmmakers or, um, you know, that's because the narrative around women at large has been written by men. And therefore, today, in this time, we just need to ask important questions that why has, why have we reached this state? Why has this happened? So why don't we have enough filmmakers? I think that examination is really important. Um, we're going to pause there because we yeah, could talk about this all day. Yeah, exactly. um, and in fact, we are going to talk about it on the next panel as well. But I wanted you to just thank you all for, you know, I know we talked about some sensitive topics and thank you for being brave in your programming and in coming here and talking about it. So thank you. We're going to take a break of about...